Today on Build to Last, the future of skyscrapers. When you needed a really big beam, you had to cut down a really big tree. The turf beneath your feet. Is that that true bounce that you're going to get off of that turf? And that belongs in a museum. Everything in here has history. Every could possibly be priceless. It's time for Built to Last. Built to Last is brought to you by the Chicago Regional Council of Carpenters Labor and Management Committee and the Boy Scouts of America Pathway to Adventure Council. Welcome to Built to Last. I'm Monica Peterson. And I'm Mark Nilsson. We're here at the Chicago Regional Council of Carpenters Apprenticeship and Training Center where future skilled carpenters learn their trade. Speaking of the future, sometimes innovation doesn't lead to what we expect, but it can still be exciting. The skyscrapers of tomorrow, for instance, won't be made of gleaming metal and glass, but of rich, strong wood. What about flying cars? They always said it'd be flying cars in the future. Yeah. Wood for centuries has been used across the world, Japan, Norway, anywhere you look. It's a really compelling way of building because of that history. There are buildings throughout North America that are built with mass timber solutions that are over 100 or 150 years old. And the oldest timber building in the world is 1,400 years old. Well, mass timber is really kind of a category or a phrase that's just recently come into use. Mass timber is a system of framing that consists of large engineered lumber framing components. Mass timber really includes heavy timber, so timbers, glue laminated beams, cross laminated timber, laminated veneer lumber, so it's just a a way to describe all these products under one umbrella. We're, we're witnessing a renaissance, a rebirth of timber construction. In Portland, uh, in British Columbia, all over the Pacific Northwest, it's really taken off. Uh, the University of British Columbia recently finished a 16-story student housing building. UBC Brock Commons, it was a floor of wood, floor enclosure, and it sort of went up uh, basically two floors per week. Uh, and the way that was successful is because the enclosure was paired with the, the structure. Because you're prefabricating these large-scale elements and just craning them into place, you can really speed up your construction time. And so that's where we're starting to see some of the advantage. Most of the modern tall wood buildings include a lot of wood, but also concrete, especially podium levels below grade, and then steel, a lot of steel for connections, but also steel components as well. The biggest challenge is just public perception. Well, Chicago had a little bit of a fire problem in the late 1800s, so since then they've been a little uh, worried and concerned with wood structures. When you say wood construction in North America, where so much of our single family home construction is stick frame, that's what everybody thinks of. It's really important to differentiate between mass timber and light wood framing. Light wood framing because of the dimensions of the pieces of wood that are being used. Think of that big block of wood or that big branch you throw in a, a fire pit. If you need to start a campfire and all you have is a big log and a match, you know you're not gonna get anywhere, right? It's harder to ignite, and then when it does ignite, it again burns at a predictable rate. Mass timber actually um, will burn on its perimeter for a, a short period of time, but will actually, the char layer will insulate it. All the wood fiber that's not heated in that section is still carrying full load. So it can be designed accordingly. Say they've done the engineering and they determine that they need 12 inches by 12 inch wood column to support the load. And whatever species of wood they're using, they've done the char testing, and whatever temperature range they're gonna reach before the sprinklers kick in, say they're gonna lose two inches of charring all the way around. So it'll be engineered as a 16 by 16 column, lose two inches of charring all the way around, you have a 12 inch column still there. And it, we're not just relying on the dimension of the timber for fire protection. Also an active fire protection system like a sprinkler system is, is extremely important uh, because even if the, the beam, call it, won't burn through, you still don't want the surface of it to burn at all and, and create smoke within a building. They've actually found that the wood performs better than steel 
They've done side-by-side -side comparisons. Timber is inherently very strong. It has a high strength to weight ratio. So um, for its weight, it's, it's very strong. If you're comparing it to say concrete, which is very heavy, you get much better strength to weight out of uh, mass timber. In the olden days, when you needed a really big beam or a really big column, right, you had to cut down a really big tree. For a long time, it wasn't feasible or sustainable to build with large pieces of timber. Uh, but now that um, we can fabricate pieces out of smaller, sustainably harvested uh, timber members, we have a whole wide range of uh, possibilities open to us that we didn't have before. People are more aware of carbon and the and importance that it has in the environment. You know, as a tree grows, it's sequestering carbon, it's taking carbon out of the atmosphere, and it stays locked in the wood for as long as that wood is in your building. Using wood that stores carbon instead of uh, building materials that emit carbon during the manufacturing process, that's a, a real win for woods. So you actually have the potential to not just be carbon neutral, but build a building that could maybe even be a carbon sink. This is our bearing surface, so we want it nice and flat. The Carpenters Union, to me, one of the biggest things that they bring to the table is the education. Uh, in the Chicago area here, for instance, we have the training facility in Elk Grove Village, and they're just doing a fantastic job of trying to make sure these people that are coming into the trade really understand what they're doing and, and can, they have the skills to go out and do the job properly. A lot of angles, a lot of geometry, um, and the biggest thing is learning the wood. I think we have the opportunity to create some really beautiful spaces. I mean, there's a reason everybody uses wood for their floors and their finishes. It's a beautiful, warm material that we like to be around and to see and to touch. There's a continuous race around the world to go taller, larger, faster. Um, I think we're gonna see some amazing things out of mass timber in the next few years. Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable was the very first person that was non-native that settled in this region. Everything that we know of Chicago that's sprung up since then, we have du Sable to thank for it. Every boy needs a foundation. A foundation he can stand on. To embrace opportunity. To overcome obstacles. Because this is the time to equip a boy with what he needs for where he's going. And where he's going is anywhere he wants. Keeping restaurants and hotels up to date with the latest design trends is a constant challenge. Finding qualified contractors isn't at finishingchicago.com. We work with top designers and general contractors who use the latest painting, drywall finishing, and wall covering techniques in Chicagoland's premier hotels and restaurants. The hospitality industry relies on finishingchicago.com as its free resource to find quality finishing contractors. For a great finish, start with finishingchicago.com. At Armstrong Ceiling and Wall Solutions, we take great pride in making a positive difference in the lives of people. With the broadest portfolio in the industry and the technical performance to back it up, you can design and install with confidence. Our ceiling construction expertise, training, and pre-engineered ceiling solutions make it easy for you to seamlessly transition from one end of the building to the other. Improve construction efficiencies and keep every job on time, on budget, and on the mark with Armstrong Ceiling and Wall Solutions. Faster, easier, better. The American journey has traversed both peaks and valleys. Sometimes our grandest achievements are built from the depths of our darkest moments. The DuSable Museum of African American History in Chicago stands proudly as a lesson of all we've done and all that we've yet to do. The DuSable History Museum began in um, the early 1960s as the Ebony Museum of Negro History and Art. But in 1968, that name was changed to the DuSable Museum of African American History because Jean-Baptiste Point DuSable was the very first person uh, that was non-native that settled in this region, had a homestead, a business, and everything that we know of Chicago that's sprung up since then, we have DuSable to thank for it. Artist and social activist Dr. Margaret Burroughs originally set up the museum in the first floor of her house. The museum started as basically a grassroots passion project of Dr. Burroughs. You know, it, it, there was no grand vision when she began, but it has morphed into something amazing. 
1971, the museum relocated into the Daniel Burnham Design Building on the edge of Chicago's Washington Park. We are the oldest African-American culture museum uh, in the country. We're very proud of that. We also want, to, want people to know that we serve a constituency outside of Chicago. Our collections, our programs are designed to talk about African-American history and culture, not in the context of Chicago, not in the context of the south side of Chicago, but in the context of the world. One of my instructors at, uh, at our training school, he and I was talking about black history. And I had invited him to come out to the museum and see the museum because most people of other ethnicities may walk past the place but never come and see black history. He said, you know what, let's, let's, let's do this with the apprentices. And so uh, I gave him lunch over there, which was a nice soul food lunch. And a lot of people never ate soul food before. I, I think this is a great event. The more we know about each other and the more you know, you're the same as the next guy. We need to learn about each other so that we can learn to respect each other. The individual that left us the most valuable part of this collection, James C. Hall, was a postal clerk. He was also a member of the National Federation of Postal Clerk. So he was a union man. And after lunch, they went on a tour. We'll be talking with you about uh, African American history. Some stories you may be familiar with, some stories maybe not. Today, people are extremely removed from the, the past. Du Sable's father was a man of French descent. His father was a French mariner. His father actually took control of his life when he was a very young man, and he was raised and educated in France uh, as a gentleman. So it's like mind-blowing when people come here and they see this man of obvious African descent and all of the amazing things that he was able to do in a time when people like him, people of African descent, were marginalized, enslaved, victims. And the DuSable Museum shows you that. You basically get a timeline of where you came from, where you all went, and where you're going to. Our students was just excited about it. So to me, that was a success because it was, it was all about them learning. So this exhibit is called Red, White, Blue, and Black. It is the story of blacks in the armed forces. I'm a, a member of the museum. I remember when it, they didn't have as many exhibits. So this exhibit includes the Revolutionary War. It also includes the Civil War. To see the exhibit that they have put in around uh, black uh, veterans, uh, that's impressive to me. Exposure is really important, but exposure itself is not gonna do that. The importance of a museum like this, education. Sometimes people just get a general idea from school, you know, you might have heard how this happened, that happened. Representation is everything. It really is. It, it determines how we view ourselves. It's very important to the psyche. We know that after the colonies obtained their independence from Your empathy Britain, for me probably increases when you know where I came from, when you know the struggle that I had. People who were enslaved and owned by other people. We are here to take the artifacts that we have, lay them bare, and tell the truths of history. This exhibit is called Freedom Resistance and the journey toward equality. It starts with the transatlantic slave trade. Until you actually get visuals of some of the stuff that people had to go through, it kind of blows your mind and it, you, know, you actually think about it way deeper than you ever have. The image in the far uh, corner there um, is actually a cross section of the hold of a slave ship. The dark marks, those are bodies of the slaves. And maybe it does go back to the issue of exposure, that our exposure to them, the exposure to us, I think is an educational process. We was looking at some of the deteriorated areas in the museum that just needed some cosmetic work and things done, but they don't have the funding to get it done. As a museum that depends very much on donations uh, to survive, donations of money are very important, but donations of services are just as important. We committed to it being a, a, a long-term project that we would do with the museum. And when the union came in and said, not only will we come in here and do it, we'll bring the paint. I was overjoyed. What better place to advertise our apprenticeship program than to have our mark in the museum. The original DuSable Museum site had previously been a social club and boarding house for African-American railroad workers. She 
gets to go home and say, hey, I got to gold leaf in a museum. I mean, how many people get to do that? Even as a, uh, a painter, I've been doing this 15 years, I never gold leafed in a museum. When you need a concrete contractor for your commercial project, you can't waste time waiting through countless unproven contractors who don't specialize in the job type you need or service your area. ConcreteIL.com lets you browse Northern Illinois' top contractors to find the perfect fit for your exact needs. You can filter our vetted list of contractors by both job type and location, and even request proposals directly through the site. Thinking commercial concrete? Think ConcreteIL.com. Meet the new family of Blaze Laser Measures from Bosch. Go ahead, turn it on and start measuring. It's that simple. The Blaze family offers a wide range of functions to tackle any measuring job. Extend your reach with accuracy up to a 16th of an inch. With Bluetooth enabled devices, easily transfer measurements to your smartphone or tablet with free Bosch apps. Reach farther, work faster, and stay accurate with the Bosch Blaze family of laser measures. Measure on. History should never be painted over, but sometimes a fresh coat of paint applied by well-trained, skilled hands can really help a history museum shine. I am very proud to be working in this building. So it's a little intimidating, to be honest, with you coming into an area that's got priceless artifacts. This is the kind of stuff you're gonna be doing when you're in the trade. Not every job is gonna be inside of a bedroom or you know a house. I mean, we try to have a pep talk before we even come into the space and, and let our students know that, hey, listen, everything in here has history, everything in here could possibly be priceless. As we walk through this museum uh, with the union members identifying projects that we take on, uh, their willingness to take on projects that they're, oh, well, they're not going to do that, especially because they're using apprentices, and they're saying yes. I have full confidence in the students. You know what, sometimes on a job site they don't really get the chance to do the work, but as long as they have good direction, these students are fully capable of doing a nice job. Just check it, make sure you can reach all that there. We're here, learning what's considered to be full finish, which is more towards the end of stages of school. The faculty has set up the apprentices to succeed by carefully scoping out the job. They come in, they look to see exactly what time, materials, and everything that'll be needed. And they normally have it here for us so that they can teach us on site. We come into the space, it doesn't matter if it's a small job, big job, quality control is always our first measure. We make sure that we cover the floor so that we don't ruin the carpet. We cover the windows. We take all the outlet covers off. Once you get everything covered, the walls are gonna need some attention. So you're patching, you're priming the walls. After that, you try to put a, a finished coat. And I would save the detail work for the very end. Seeing as how the detail on this wall is higher up, you have to be comfortable with scaffolding, which is heights. The room will have been painted, completely painted, and then they go back and do what's got to be very, very skillful, almost tedious work. That level of skill fascinates me. Gold leaf is fun to work with, but gold leaf is very delicate and it moves very easily. It's on like a parchment paper and you have to transfer it very carefully onto the surface. Then you use brushes that can articulate, get in all the little grooves and spaces. And it really brings out the room, especially with the room being white. Um, that gold just helps it pop and it keeps you excited. You realize that there's so many things that you can do. She gets to go home and say, hey, I got to gold leaf in a museum. I mean, how many people get to do that even as a uh, a painter, I've been doing this 15 years, I never gold leafed in a museum. I feel like my teachers have trained me to be successful and do what I need to do. Um, and just their belief in me that I can goes a long way. It, it makes me very proud to see the students do this job and it makes me proud to see that they come out and do the entire job. With a little bit of direction from me, these students are fully capable and it does it does bring a you know a smile to your face. The work that these people are doing here, the union and the painters, it's amazing. And it harkens back to the beginnings of this institution, people just coming in their own free time or their own accord to assist in helping Dr. Burroughs get this mission off of the ground. And that's, I feel, is what these painters and what the union are doing today. The money that it saves us can be used to do other things here at the museum. How it's important for us to have the connection 
with a union, not just the painters union, with other unions. That support is extremely important, especially in Chicago. We're a union town. I think it's dear to all of us. I'm a city of Chicago resident myself, and things like this, they really do humble you and, and make you feel like you're a part of some of the community. Anytime that people are willing to come in and assist in this way, it, it, it's, it's something that's commendable. You understand immediately how important organizing and being together is. You see a resurgence of something that we saw in the 60s, early 70s, of people understanding that coming together as a group made them much more effective. So having people here that have the skill set to work on the masonry or the upkeep of the building is, is, is tantamount to the preservation of the objects that we have inside. It's good to know that you're working somewhere where a lot of people are going to be going through. You want to be proud of the work that you put out into the world. It is a beautiful job. You can look around and see like, wow, it's, it's nice. And it is art, absolutely it's art. And it, it fits right in here to the museum as well. The rubber pellets, they actually add to the absorption of uh, the biomechanics of, of the human body onto the field. Stabila lasers and levels, designed for contractors that perform high-risk layouts every day. These accurate and durable lasers have a working range up to 1,800 feet. Square your next job site with confidence. Stabila, how true pros measure. You, you would have told me five years ago that we would have had close to 1,000 people on the street doing good things for the community. I'd have said, I don't know where we're going to get them from. This is all about changing stuff in the neighborhood where people don't have the wherewithal or the financial resources to do something. A lot of times you're going to see somebody actually break down in tears. The press doesn't cover this. This is something we do because it's the right thing to do. IBEW Local 134. We give back to the communities where we live and to those who need it most. The all new Skill Saw Heavy Duty Worm Drive Table Saw with Stand. The world's only full size table saw with worm drive gearing. Delivering unmatched durability, unwavering power, and unrivaled torque. So you get better results, faster. Nothing compares to worm drive gearing. Skill saw, stay true. Welcome back to Built to Last. Now, you played a lot of sports growing up, didn't you, Mark? I sure did. A star athlete. Well, maybe average, <laughs> but I have a lot of injuries to prove that. Well, carpenters and their partners are working to make one aspect of sports much safer. When I was at Rice University, we were going down to the University of Texas, and we were playing a three-game series. And Coach Graham told us um, as we're departing, he said, listen, we're going to go play Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and we're going to take Monday and Tuesday off because your bodies are going to be really sore. And we were kind of surprised at that because thinking, hey, we're college kids. We're probably in the best shape of our lives. We should be able to handle this. And after that three-game series, wow, was he right. No doubt about it, the sporting industry, uh, along with artificial surfaces, have come a long way. Uh, years ago, it was just a plain asphalt foundation and a thin carpet of uh, roughly three quarters of an inch was just put down over it. Well, that was almost just as hard as the, the concrete they were playing in. The advances over the years in synthetic turf fields, both big and small, have provided durability, not only to the institutions that take advantage of them, but also to the players that compete on them. Now, the product that they've done with the rubber pellets, um, the way they've advanced the product, you can go out and play on a daily basis and don't nearly feel the grind in your knees or your ankles as you do back in the day. And the advantages of these ever-improving surfaces are proving to be a game-changer for those who make the switch. The rubber pellets, they actually add to the absorption of uh, the biomechanics of, of the human body onto the field. It's the rubber that will give, it's the foundation underneath it that will give. There's a lot less minor injuries on the turf because you know, it's, it's a consistent surface. You don't have little potholes here and there across like a grass field where you might have divots. Every day, there's probably thousands of ground balls or even balls that hit that turf. And the resilience of that product to be able to withstand all of that work 
makes it beneficial for the kids because it's the safety issue of, again, of that, that true bounce that you're gonna get off of that turf, the, to be able to read it. We are installing an artificial turf athletic field. In this case, it is a combination baseball and softball area uh, at Clemente High School. When you have a lot of sports now with uh, football, soccer, lacrosse, baseball, softball, a lot of multi-purpose type use fields, it's very difficult for natural grass to handle that. Now, there's very few restrictions as to, you know, when they can be out on these fields practicing, playing, exercising. Training is very important that they all work as a team. Generally, we're working eight to ten guys uh, as a group out on the field. You have the gravel base on the field and then we put down a half inch pad on the field that helps for padding and then helps take out any dips on the field. We roll the carpet out, we sew the seams together and then after all the lines are cut, all the inserts are done, we come with a sweeper that sweeps all the fibers up and then a spreader comes and spreads the sand out and then there's a layer of sand on the bottom with a layer of rubber on top to help even more padding. Right off the bat, you have to know that one of the more, most important things is to make sure it's safe. If someone's gonna walk on it, play on it. We try and make sure that like the base on the field is all nice and flat and there's no imperfections. There's not gonna be any dips where they're gonna lose their footing. All the seams line up on the turf well. There's no overlaps where it could create a tripping hazard. We use a lot of uh, nails, 14 inch nails, and we have to make sure none of them are in the ground. Definitely a good sense of pride knowing that just quality craftsmanship on the field for them. There have been other schools that they put down the, the wrong bedding. Those turf fields had to be torn up and redone. So you need to you know, make sure you get a quality company in there that has a good reputation that's done that before. Some of the fields that uh, I've helped install, you know, you drive by and you see the kids playing on it. Oh, it's, it's, it's a good feeling. There were tons of workers here for that, you know, three or four month stint that they put everything together, including the track. So, I mean, it was a major going through, a major overhaul of this area. I and mean, it's something that everyone has a little bit of pride in and you know, they enjoy the facility whenever they get a chance to use it. Especially knowing if a union shop put it in, just knowing that we put it in, it's, just, it's our work. That's all for this episode of Built to Last. And check us out on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We'll see you next time. Monica, do you think my performance was a little wooden today? A little wooden? Mm-hmm.